Hello, welcome to Chamber Live, the latest edition of our Health and Safety Forum, brought to you by East Lancs Chamber of Commerce and sponsored for us today by Intersolia. Uh, the views expressed in this webinar don't necessarily represent the views of the East Lancs Chamber, and they are correct as of the time of publication, which is the 9th of December 2020. Today we're focusing on fire safety, uh, and whilst much of what you'll hear today is focused towards the implications for your business, inevitably there are going to be takeaways that are just as relevant in the home environment as well. I know it's a really interesting hour that we've got ahead of us. First of all, as ever, we're very grateful to our sponsors for supporting our events. Intersolia have been solid supporters of the group for some time now. They provide customised solutions for managing chemical health and safety in an environmentally friendly way. They've been doing that since 1999 and operate across Europe in Sweden, Germany, Denmark, Serbia, and of course, here in the UK. Tim O'Donnell, who's representing them today, he's got over 20 years HSE management experience, spanning numerous industries, including construction, refurbishment, manufacturing, distribution, and facilities management. As a health and safety professional, he spent several years as a customer of Intersolia and a user of their systems uh, before joining the team and becoming CEO of Intersolia UK. Uh, Tim, over to you. Thanks, Simon. Um, uh, and good morning, everybody. Um, could you click up the first slide, please? Excellent. Thank you. Um, well, as um, Simon uh, very kindly uh, described, um, I used to be a customer of Intersolia. For those that haven't uh, uh, heard me um, talk about um, Intersolia and our services before, um, we are prim uh, primarily um, a chemical safety um, uh, organization looking after COSH and COSH compliance. Uh, next slide, please, Simon. And um, we do this through a, um, a, a, an intuitive um, uh, program called iChemistry. So it is a web-based solution um, to manage all of your chemical needs. Okay, next slide, please, Simon. So I'm not going to insult all your intelligence, but um, what is COSH for? Um, we seem to, when, when I speak to, um, uh, health and safety professionals, and certainly those um, uh, people within an organization who aren't necessarily a health and safety professional, but have the responsibility for health and safety. Their attitude very much is um, put a tick in the box and that's okay. And when it comes to managing COSH, they would just have a risk assessment that basically says um, use chemical in um, as a um, uh, as per the safety data sheet or um, PPE as uh, um, in accordance with safety data sheets, which obviously, as we all know, um, isn't sufficient. So the objective of COSH is to look after our work um, uh, colleagues. So how do we do this? We do it by identifying um, hazards, keeping accurate safety data sheets, because that is where all of our controls fall out of, um, because we have to identify what the hazards are in order to um, put in the correct and um, applicable controls. Um, we do it by considering um, substituting harmful chemicals with less harmful ones and uh, applying uh, an activity-based COSH assessment to those activities that use chemicals. And we do that through the identification of control measures and reviewing them when necessary. And next slide, please, Simon. Um, it also, um, we do it through using um, uh, effective control equipment. So that can be anything from LEV, total in, um, enclosures or, or, or whatever. Um, control procedures. So the ways that we work, whether that's through supervision and training to reduce exposure, um, through maintenance of equipment, examination and testing of those um, uh, pieces of equipment and control measures. Um, very important worker behavior. So identifying um, not just the control measures, but having those that have to use those control measures to understand why they're being asked to use them and um, how they should be used and the consequences if they don't. So um, make sure that they follow those control measures uh, and use them correctly. We also do it through changing how often the tasks are undertaken. So if we can reduce the number of exposures, then that's another way of doing it. But all of this comes out through the um, um, risk assessment process. Next slide, please. So control equipment, as we all know, can be anything from portable 
um, uh, fume extraction um, to full-blown LEV um, uh, systems. Other controls that we tend to forget about are um, things that are more reactive like spillages and captures, decontamination, cleanup procedures. Um, PPE, of course, is very relevant at the moment because not only are we wearing PPE in hazardous um, uh, activities in our workplace, but of course we're wearing PPE now um, uh, when we go out outside. And next slide, please. So ways of working. We can control how we work um, and um, the operating procedures and how the tasks are done. So as managers, we identify what the task is, what the controls are, what the hazards are, and how the person that we're asking to carry out those um, uh, activities are informed and trained. It reduces emergency, um, or oh, sorry, it includes emergency procedures. So any decontamination, anything that um, uh, goes wrong, any work permits for carrying out certain hazardous um, uh, activities. But how do you know if you don't carry out an activity-based risk assessment whether an activity is hazardous and it needs a permit to work. Um, so it's really important to carry out these um, activity-based risk assessments. It also means testing of control measures. It's something that we encourage all of our customers to do. And that is when you've identified the, your, your controls is then to test them to make sure that they are working. Our systems um, help um, organize this and uh, record these um, inspections and audits. Anything that is um, captured through an audit is um, recorded and anything that's recorded electronically can be pinned to any of our um, risk assessments. Next slide, please. Work behavior. Now, this is a big one. Um, I think that in the forthcoming year or so, I think we'll have a bit of a change in attitude towards ch chemical safety. Um, because of COVID and people understand the transmission of um, biohazards, um, certainly, and the precautions in order to prevent um, uh, um, somebody becoming infected, then we all wear masks and face shields and um, make sure our hands are clean and, and sanitized. And I think that will transpose into our workplace. So worker behavior is very important and it all comes down to um, their understanding. It also includes, of course, using the correct um, control equipment, uh, the PPE, following hygiene um, uh, procedures and supervision. So we understand that where there are um, uh, gaps, we can identify why there are gaps there, whether it's a lack of understanding or whatever, and then put those measures in place. Next slide, please. So eye chemistry, this is the sales pitch, guys. Um, eye chemistry is a perfect tool. As Simon said at the beginning, I was a customer of Intersolia for eight years. Um, as a health and safety professional myself, myself um, we had over 350 odd chemicals and 600 odd risk assessments. And I was the only health and safety professional on site. But we managed to control all of our hazards associated with chemical use um, through eye chemistry. Next slide, please, Simon. So what does it do? It provides you with an ordered structure, um, chemical product register, so you can identify what chemicals you have on site. Not only that, it can give you a purchasing and a production application, so you can keep control of who's bringing chemicals onto site um, so they don't slip through the net. We offer a comprehensive safety data sheet library and an updating service. Um, which includes restrictions lists and um, uh, authority reports. And that can include anything from um, uh, chemicals that might be listed in EH40 um, on the exposure um, register or um, chemicals that have um, uh, carcinogens or uh, mutagens or anything like that. So we can identify all of that for you and it's available at the click of a button. We also run a substitution model, so you can identify where your hazardous chemicals are and um, whether it's appropriate or feasible to um, uh, substitute those. But if it's not, it um, holds a record of that consideration. So you can prove, should you have to, um, later, um, later on, 
that you have actually gone through that process and um, the steps that you've taken for substitution. Of course, we have the risk assessment um, module. And as I mentioned before, it is um, very much activity based. It is not something that you put a tick in the box. So it is absolutely activity based. Um, and all of this, of course, is available through um, our mobile app. So the um, risk evaluation is a, um, a fantastic uh, tool that you act, um, risk assess the activity. And if the activity involves three, four, five chemicals, however many number, um, then our module, you can type in every chemical that you use during that activity and assess the whole activity as a one, um, which is a lot more um, practical, of course. It holds employee information, um, archiving history, um, and support. And as I mentioned before, it's available through a mobile app as well. Um, next slide, please, Simon. If you have any questions, please let us know. During this time, um, we have been running a COVID um, uh, support program. Um, we will be offering um, new um, uh, customers a discount to encourage them and to help them during this time um, and possibly a deferred payment um, period as well. Um, so if you're interested at all about what we can do for you and how we can support you during this terrible time that we're all going through, um, uh, you'll have my details. Please feel free to contact me. That's it. Thank you, Simon. Great. Thank you, Tim. Um, has anyone got any questions for Tim? Just quickly looking at, uh, no one's waving wildly at me. So we will include Tim's contact details in the follow-up email. And once again, uh, we are hugely grateful to Intisolia for their support for the Health and Safety Forum, um, not only today, but, um, but throughout the last few years as well. So uh, thank you, Tim. Okay, on to uh, our next speaker and uh, Steve Wilcock. I'll quickly introduce him. Steve's official title is Training Coordinator and Head Trainer at Northwest Fire Training Limited. He served in the Royal Navy for five years prior to joining Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service in 1994, currently in his 27th year and continues to serve as an operational officer. He's got a passion for training and uh, he independently set up Northwest Fire Training Limited, a dedicated staff fire training company, uh, providing accredited training on site to many organizations. Uh, and he launched that back in 2008. When he's not doing his, both of his jobs, busy lad, uh, he's a father of two and lives with his wife, Mags, in Ramsbottom. And I know this is going to be a fascinating session. Over to you, Steve. It's, all right. Can you, I guess you can hear me now. Thumbs up. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, my job over the next sort of um, 40 minutes or so is to make a little bit of a splash in this subject uh, uh, that we call fire. Um, I've talked actually uh, to, I know it's Chris from IOSH is on. Uh, we did do a talk for IOSH uh, uh, earlier on in the uh, the COVID pandemic, um, uh, readying your business for, for the, uh, the lockdown. So uh, this one particularly is to talk about fire and, you know, really think about the fact that fire isn't an act of god some people might think it is uh, and if you lose your building in a fire people think well it was meant to be but actually you know there's a lot of stuff that you can do to stop this th eventuality happening so very quickly we'll have a look at uh, uh start us off very quickly talk about the legislation just so you know your starting point this legislation the reg reform fire safety order repealed many other pieces of legislation it simplified legislation in your workplace and all it simply says, if you're anything other than a single private dwelling, then you will fall under this legislation. So it's pretty much every, every business, uh, every building, charity shops, empty buildings, a risk assessment has to be completed by the employer, the owner, the occupier, to try and keep people safe in the event of a fire. Okay, so it's a risk assessment process. That's where we are now. Part of that risk assessment includes training and there's gonna be a little bit of a focus on that this morning but what I want to start off with is a very simple slide uh, it doesn't look simple when I first put it up but it is uh, right at the bottom there uh, this is my little uh, highly offensive uh, in, unconsciously incompetent slide offensive because we don't like that word incompetent but we are 
all incompetent at something because there are so many things in life to be competent at. So this very simple schematic, you may have seen this uh, used uh, in other applic uh, you know, applications elsewhere, but very simply, right at the bottom there, you've got the unconsciously incompetent, consciously incompetent, consciously competent, unconsciously competent there at the top. Very simply, uh, the analogy for me would be driving. And the reason you use driving is because it's, it's wholly relatable if you're a driver. Um, my son, he's, he's, uh, he's just turned 17. He thinks he's going to be a wonderful driver. He's never tried it, but he thinks when he gets behind the wheel, he's going to smash it out the ballpark. That's because he's down here at the bottom. He's the unconscious incompetent. He's never tried it. He's not aware of how incompetent he is until he does his first driving lesson. When he does his first driving lesson, he will suddenly bubble up to that blue band there. He suddenly realises a lot more to it than meets the eye. There's quite a few pedals to go at underneath the steering wheel, a whole bunch of gears to go at, all these spindles sticking off the drive shaft, and that's before he's looked out the window. A lot of multitasking going on, and as he bunny hops up the road, he suddenly realises, wow, I'm not that good at this. I need some, uh, some practice. So he becomes conscious of his incompetence. If there's a load of lessons at some point down the track, at one point, uh, his uh, instructor might say, well, do you know what? You're good enough to do a test. So uh, crack on, let's get the test done. And uh, if he passes his test, he's now in this purple band. He is competent, which is wonderful. He's competent on the road. He's not going to kill anybody. And he's certainly not going to crash his car because he's, he's clearly competent, but he's consciously competent. And that means he's got to think about it. It's in his conscious mind. He's going through this process in his head, mirror, signal, maneuver. He's got to think about every step of the way. But gradually, as we are continually exposed to something, your subconscious mind has a habit of watching what your conscious mind is doing and saying, you know, what? I can see what you're doing there. I, I can run that for you in the background. And actually, we start to bubble up to that unconscious competence. It's really difficult to actually, um, you know, think about something that you regularly do in, in a super safe way because you just run it on autopilot. You'll know this. You'll arrive at home. And you will be, uh, you'll forget the journey. You won't even remember the journey. You know, I can't, I can't remember putting the seatbelt on. I can't remember if I indicated or not on the way home, but you did. You did it on autopilot. Become the unconscious competent. Now, there's two uh, levels here which are threatening to us, the, the bottom and the top. I'm sure you've worked that out. The top, because complacency can creep in. And, of course, people drive cars and they're wrestling sandwiches out of a box or trying to, you know, view a, a mobile phone message or something while they're at the wheel. This is what people do because, because they become very complacent. Uh, so that could be a problem. But right at the bottom is also a significant problem. The unconscious incompetent. This is absolutely where I would apply this in the world of fire. The problem with fire is it's a uh, low probability, high consequence event. Very rarely are we exposed to a fire in our workplaces. From your side of the sort of table, I suppose, it, it would be, you know, maybe a once in a career thing that might happen. From my side, it's something I see quite regularly. In Great Manchester Fire Rescue Service, we're mobilised to a, a commercial building uh, in, the, in the Great Manchester County jurisdiction, normally about once every six hours or so. Domestic properties come in, uh, you know, reports for a domestic property fire in the region of one every three hours. Uh, so, 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 of course, the, the, from the business side of things, you're not exposed to it. It's low probability, but it's high consequence if you get it wrong. Just like that driving analogy, the first time you're exposed to it, you suddenly realize, wow, we're not ready for this. We've been unconsciously incompetent because we've not been exposed to it. So that is kind of the sort of backstory for uh, examples of things that have happened and I'm going to sort of use this example here. This is an, uh, an, uh, an infamous picture. Uh, this picture, it was uh, had a degree of infamy because it was taken at 20 past six in Paris. Uh, it's Notre Dame, 20 past six on the 15th of April, 2019. Uh, the fire alarm's just activated in that building. Okay, it's just come on. Uh, so let's zoom in a little bit and just uh, morph that picture into my lovely three-dimensional uh, picture of Notre Dame. You get a sense of the building uh, and its size here. You can see a couple of little cars knocking around at the bottom. Well, the fire alarm came on, the detector activated in the roof apex up here, uh, fire alarm comes on. At this point, everything is going swimmingly. We know fires happen, we know we have problems in buildings, and we know fire detection systems are gonna do a wonderful job 
uh, telling us about them and give us an opportunity to respond to that event. So, so far, everything is going really well. It's 20 past six in the evening. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to very quickly whistle stop so we get a bit more of an understanding about what exactly may have happened in the apex of that roof structure there. I'm going to pause Notre Dame for a second. We're going to come back to it shortly. Very quickly, very simple concept. And anyone that's health and safety will be seeing this many times. Triangle of fire, heat, fuel, oxygen, get these three sides together. And of course, you've got your potential fire scenario, fire being an exothermic chemical reaction, gives out heat and light. and produces something new. Uh, it's an oxidation reaction. And the idea is to stop it and take any side away. So we can put some water on it, remove the heat, cool it down, triangle collapses, fill a vessel up full of carbon dioxide, remove the oxygen, purge that oxygen out with an inert gas, carbon dioxide, it's very happy and stable. That reaction can't take place, it's chemistry, it has to go out. You could remove the fuel, you could turn the gas off. Uh, you could leave something to burn out. It would run out of fuel, it's not gonna burn for the rest of the time. These are ways the fire goes out. But what exactly is happening? If you looked at the, uh, this scenario here, you've got a, a, a chair, just like any object on uh, planet Earth, uh, made out of lots and lots of molecules. Okay, and these molecules aren't stationary like this. Um, so just a little bit of uh, whistle stop through science here. If you look very closely at anything under an atomic microscope, you will see that molecules are continually vibrating all the time. Right at the surface, little molecules are being bounced off into space uh, so that's what's happening that's why things smell if you smell a piece of wood it's gonna it's gonna smell of wood because it's giving the vapor off it's a very slow process this vaporization if that's what you want to call it uh, you're not going to come in tomorrow and find all your furniture's vaporized again uh, it's it's a very slow process but it is happening so this this vibration is just bouncing little molecules off into space that vibration is energy if you put a heat source nearby that's going to put more energy into that object. It's going to create that vibration to it. That vibration is going to increase and actually it's going to bounce molecules off at a much faster rate. And consequently, it's going to smell a little bit more. That's exactly what's happened. You've increased the process it's hundreds of thousands of times that's already happening. And you've got this increase in smell. It's the very early stages of, some, of moving down this, this storyboard towards fire. As molecules are bounced off at a much faster rate, we'll actually get to the point where we will see visible vapors coming off that object. This is what we call, what well, we call them pyrolytic gases. This process is called pyrolysis, okay? The release of vapors because something's got warm. Um, there's every chance at this point that your fire detection system is gonna come on. You're out because the, the, uh, this cloud piece is rich in free ions. It's an ionization detector and that's on the ceiling. It's gonna, it's gonna come on and you're gonna respond to it. And if you respond and you get to that area quickly enough, you could turn that heater off. And actually what you've done is intervened in a process. And when we talk about intervening, uh, the short version of that intervention, it's something the world of fire we use all the time. When did intervention occur? You intervene in that process, switch that heater off, We'd actually class that for statistical uh, data purposes as a false alarm, believe it or not. And the reason we class it as a, a false alarm is because the uh, system, the software that's uh, government produced, you used UK wide for all fire services. If you fill in your fire report and you put down, uh, you know, there's a little checkbox with the flames present at this incident. And if you uh, say no, uh, you know, what was the reason for the false alarm is the next box. And you're thinking, this wasn't actually a false alarm. This was the fire alarm working brilliantly. And the problem is with fire alarm systems is they get a bad press because according to government data, 95% fire alarms are false and only 5% of fire alarms are real. What we can reasonably deduce from that is on 5% of occasions, we've got visible flames and 95% of the time we haven't. So what is happening in that 95% of the time? Well, um, I would say 95% of the time, there will obviously be uh, uh, faults on systems, you know, whether the detector head maybe has had, uh, formed an electrical fault, but 95% of the time, I would say it would be reasonable to say there's been an environmental change that's happened in that room. So it might be dust from a work person, it might be steam from a shower, it could be air freshener, it could be hairspray, it could be early stage pyrolytic ga gases because something's got warm. So what the fire alarm system is saying is, look, I don't know what it is, but I'd like somebody to go and have a look if that's okay. And if you get there and you switch that thing off, 
the problem has gone away. If you don't get there in time, at some point, these pyrolytic gases will get so hot, there'll be so much energy in there, it'll start to interact and react with the oxygen in the air and you'll reach its, it'll reach its auto ignition temperature and you will have flames. Okay, now if you turn up now and switch that heater off, that fire's not gonna go out because it's now the heat, which was originally coming from the heater to produce those pyrolytic gases, the heat is coming from the fire itself. So it's a cyclic process now. This is a self-sustaining phenomenon. You need to put it out, okay? So some uh, uh, extinguishing media would be required. So before we get back to Notre Dame, just very quickly want to go through this very simple graph. I say simple, let's see, <laughs> see how we get on. Very simple, right at the side there, we've got the sort of measure of the intensity of smoke, heat and flames, you know, temperature you might want to call it, um, but it's a measure of the intensity of that fire. And across the bottom there, we've got time, okay? Um, so ignition occurs at some point on that timeline. And when fire grows, it grows in what we call the growth curve. It, we can break this up into four component parts. The incipient phases, this is the very early stages of fire when it's not life threatening, it's just crackling away there, not massively uh, problematic to us. We get into the growth phase, we get into the fully developed phase, and then we get going to decay. Now decay is when all the um, uh, combustible material that's available is, is being used up and the fire has actually got nowhere to go. It's, it's used up the combustible material. Uh, so it's, it's, it's going to decay, it's going to start to sort of reduce. Uh, that might be the complete loss of a building or in a flat, the complete loss of the compartment, the flat, the, 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 uh, the, the compartment box that the flat's contained in, everything's burnt out in there. There's nothing left to burn. So uh, when we think about, uh, you know, these, these phases, there's an uh, other phase that we want to talk about, the pre-ignition phase. The pre-ignition phase is actually where the timeline starts. That's when the pyrolytic gases are there. The fire alarm's going to activate before even the flames appear. Uh, so it's really important we think about this. This is your opportunity, okay? This is your opportunity to manage a situation in the very, very early stage. And don't forget, some really good data tells us that on 90% of occasions, fires that occur, in your building are not controlled and extinguished by the fire service, they're controlled and extinguished by staff. Okay, it's really interesting that, and, and it's quite common, you know, I'll turn up at incidents and quite often send a message back, you know, out on arrival, inspection only. It's been dealt with locally on site. It's a blip in the day for the organization. The organization keeps running because somebody's taken this, what we call early intervention. So, Something like this, your fire alarm could prompt you to investigate and find a cable that's been damaged, uh, the electricity struggling to get down uh, a, a piece of wire, then you're going to get that localised overheating. And if you watch this video a little bit further, at some point, you get those flames, okay? A nice bit of early intervention there, a bit of a, <laughs> someone blows it, decides to blow it out. I want to change how that opportunity arrow looks now. Okay, I'm gonna change it to that. Um, now, I, uh, I put this slide together last night, so uh, it's the first time I've been through it, so I hope it's making perfect sense to you. But you can see opportunity drops off as the fire, it's kind of almost inversely proportional opportunity to the, the fire curve. So, so opportunity is, is massive here, but as we progress down the timeline, your opportunity drops off as the fire becomes more threatening. So when an intervention occurs, what we need is ultimately to discover it. We need somebody to get there quickly. Now, if they get there in what we call the incipient stages, about a bin sized fire, um, producing very little smoke, you know what's on fire, you can consider the possibility of using a fire extinguisher. If you get there and it's in the pre ignition phase, frustratingly, it may well be classified as a false alarm, but the fire alarm's done a wonderful job. You switch something off. You uh, pop the toast up, you turn the cooker off, you move something away from a heat source, you isolate something, you knock the electrics off. You've intervened before you even got to the ignition. So, you know, you get this brilliant uh, opportunity. Um, no two fires are the same. We get extreme examples, okay? This is a, a you know, very slow, okay? The guy, in this case, decides to switch the plug off problem goes away, no problem. Sometimes we're not afforded 
the uh, possibility of uh, extinguishing or early intervention, the focus has to be on get out. This is a, 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 some internal security CCTV camera from China, captures uh, the moment a lithium ion battery ignites and if there's ever a video that I would show somebody to remind people the importance of keeping your fire exits available in a business premises, this would be it. We get a bit of a pop, it wakes the dog up. The father goes over to isolate the, um, or to unplug the device. So an extreme, an extreme example, uh, lithium ion battery over in China. So we see all the extremes. Um, this is uh, uh, by kind permission of the owner. Uh, I was able to uh, obtain some screenshots from a, uh, some CCTV after an incident occurred at this house. This was a carelessly discarded cigarette and I cannot emphasize this enough. Seemingly benign act of throwing a cigarette down in the wrong location seems neither here nor there but if you've got a designated smoking area within your business premises you need to make sure you use it if you not if people are out to smoke in alternative locations people don't like walking to it if it's raining uh, and it becomes a cultural norm then the problem can it can create all sorts of problems i had an incident where a cigarette was dropped in a grid uh, the the smoldering transferred onto some leaves the leaves ended up on fire it set fire to the uh, downspout of the uh, plastic guttering it went up the plastic guttering, went into the um, uh, soffit board, and it took the roof off the premises just because of a carelessly discarded cigarette. This is a, a domestic premises, it's a carelessly discarded cigarette, it's been left in this planter here. Now, something interesting about cigarettes, when you drop a cigarette, it, the smoldering transfers onto something else and it creates a little ecosystem. It opens up a little cavity, air starts to move through, and it takes normally about 45 to, to minutes to 90 minutes to evolve into a fire. This here has been burning since six o'clock. It's now 1856. The window of opportunity here is huge in terms of the ability to put the fire out. It's been, it's been smoldering off for about 50 minutes and it's, about, it's been flaming fire for about six minutes. Let's have a quick look uh, at what it looks like at 10 past uh seven and now we're in 10 minutes into the incident now when people sometimes have this approach we will never tackle fires at work it's very short-sighted you might think you're being risk averse by saying do ne no never tackle a fire at work that's not being risk averse in my view you're being more risk averse allowing people or the autonomy with training to tackle a fire because um, that early intervention means the problem goes away. With training, you create the audit trail, which keeps you safe from litigation. We have some very tight criteria about when it's safe to tackle a fire. But clearly in this case, this is a non-life-threatening fight. And now we're in 10 minutes in, wholly manageable. Why has this fire not been put out yet? It's been burning for an hour and 10 minutes. Well, probably because it's a Saturday. And probably, if you look carefully there, you'll see a streak of light in the back garden. It's a nice, sunny day. The next door neighbor was well aware of the smells coming over the fence, but made the assumption it was a barbecue, okay? Uh, not a, a little bit later, at uh, 26 minutes past seven, this screenshot was taken. And of course, we see the damage that uh, has happened at this incident, okay, caused by a carelessly discarded cigarette. You can see the internal glass there has remained in situ, which is wonderful. The external glass has popped. That's really useful that stayed in situ because it stopped the fire from getting inside the premises. It still caused a lot of damage. You can see the uh, soil pipe there, the plastic end caps of this uh, lean-to, the burnt gutter in there, etc. 16,000 pounds worth of damage caused by a carelessly discarded cigarette, cigarette that was wholly manageable and easy to put out for at least an hour and 10, 15 minutes. Uh, so it just gives us a little bit of an insight into um, you know, how fires grow, how we get this very, very early notification, the early stage pyrolytic gases before we even get to the point of fire, massive windows of opportunity. So what is the message at Notre Dame? We need to be up there, get in that apex, get it sorted out, and, uh, and uh, there will be no problem. The chap, we've got a little tiny chap, he's based down here, I don't know if you can see, uh, but he's gone to... Um, uh, he's gone off to the fire panel, looked at the fire panel, tried to interpret what it says, and he goes off and checks. 
this outbuilding, the wrong location. He comes back, he returns to the outbuilding, and he ch chats with one of his colleagues uh, about the situation, not sure what's happening. The panel would have probably been quite ambiguous. Sometimes they can be, you know, loop 37, detect head 45. What does that mean? Uh, you, you know, it's, it's difficult to interpret. Um, so a guess, essentially, okay? So wrong location, two fails. First of all, failed to understand what the panels told them. And secondly, when he did his sweep of that uh, area, maybe he should have a look at the detector heads because the detector head that actuates has an LED light lit up and that closes the loop. You realize, ah, I'm absolutely in the right location. Never be subordinate to one of these detectors. Remember the best detector in the world is the one parked on the front of your face. You can detect thousands of different things with your nose. A detector doesn't know the difference between fire and uh, an ionization detector, of course, doesn't know the difference between fire and talcum powder or hairspray, but your nose is a brilliant piece of apparatus. A sniff, nothing untoward in here, need to get back and conclude the, uh, and, and get normality resumed as quickly as possible. While they're having a chat, a second detector comes on 23 minutes later. 23 minutes later. I just find this incredible. Uh, at that point, they can smell smoke in the air. They um, decide uh, to phone the fire service. The fire service turn up uh, where visible smoke could be seen coming from the roof. And uh, by the time they'd set up the infrastructure to get the hoses and breathing apparatus teams committed to do an aggressive interior attack, uh, unfortunately, things have progressed. And this is a short news clip. <laughs> So Notre Dame, absolutely incredible, um, you know, catastrophic fail. Those people, the perfect example of the unconscious incompetent, they only found out they became conscious of their incompetence at the moment they looked at the fire panel and had no concept or idea uh, of, what, of how to respond or where they needed to be. Now, there was a, uh, an, a campaign to raise some money for Notre Dame. I'm not sure if you're aware of how much money was actually raised for Notre Dame, but I can tell you it was £1.5 billion. £1.5 billion. Pounds. So it's a very simple graphic uh, uh, that uh, I found, uh, just to give you a concept of what uh, 100 million might look like and what 1 billion looks like by comparison. Um, and of course, the Notre Dame Relief Fund, uh, £1.5 billion was raised. One of the strap lines for this short talk was it's not just about cause. I can tell you when we get, we had the cube on fire in Bolton, we had the Land Rover garage in uh, Stockport, uh, we had uh, 27 appliances in attendance at the scrapyard the other year in, uh, in Bury, and the the mantra from all the uh, uh, you know the press agencies uh, you know is you know what was the cause the, all this speculation about you know was it an insurance job but is it suspicious was it not suspicious all these all this stuff that goes on all this speculation is always about cause it's not just about cause you know the Notre Dame fire what is the big question there the press were asking, you know, do we know what the cause of this fire is? Because they see it as just a thing that's happened and what sparked it off. Forget the cause. You know, yes, it's terrible it happened. It's definitely part of the jigsaw puzzle that makes the picture of the fire investigation. But for me, what set of circumstances would allow somebody to uh, uh, be in a building that was so valuable that it prov provoked an emotional response or, you know, from the, the society to the tune of 1.5 billion pounds. If it was worth raising 1.5 billion pounds for, surely it was worth training the staff. Now, the question is, you know, how, um, you know, how important is your building to you? You know, this is a low probability, high consequence event. It's unlikely to happen, but if it does, it will be the biggest red letter day of the year. So it's important we get it right. Okay, so this is a, a building we went in recently. And as you can see, no zone map. All these, you know, nothing written in at all. So 
if you if this was your premises it came up with number five what does number five mean this the clock is ticking you're in the pre-ignition phase plus possibly at the moment before even flames appear most small businesses 60 percent of small to medium enterprises never recover from a fire and you've got this beating heart of the fire strategy which is your fire panel and people don't have a zone map um you know absolutely unbelievable this has been recently serviced by a, a certain provider and they hadn't put a zone map in it's so so important at notre dame at, not notre dame at um at uh, rose park care home in scotland uh the the you know the a failure to under, interpret what the plan uh was telling them and a, a mismanagement of fire compartment doors resulted in 14 deaths absolutely incredible simple things this was a, a screenshot a, a photograph i took on site uh at a place I was at they'd had a recent refurbishment and the person who uh, didn't want the inadvertent actuation of the fire alarm to happen so they put these covers over the detector heads when they finished they left the detector heads in situ you know covered so it's really really important that we get ourselves protected uh you know it's it, the term of phrase is you know that sometimes uses all the gear and no idea training is such an integral part you have the fire alarm panel you have designated people who are going to respond to that they can interpret it they don't want to be looking at it for the first time when this problem has started in a building okay so in this case here we've got discovery but we also need to have confidence for that first call now a lot of people don't like phoning the fire service there's all sorts of myths out there you know the fire service are going to charge for um you know uh, you go to the local hospital you know the nurses absolutely brilliant at nursing not so good at making toast it turns out but uh you know you turn up at the hospital and uh, you know quite regularly people will say to oh yeah 500 pound every time you turn up Where, where's this figure come from the fire service don't charge it's government funded it's paid for by the taxpayer if it's better to have them there and not need them there's no invoice there's no prosecution okay if you're a repeat offender you might get a fire safety officer that will come down and visit and give you some information on how to minimize false alarms into the future but certainly you're not going to get prosecuted but it's a regular occurrence uh, that we get uh, sort of uh, mobilized to places and the fire service are afforded a wonderful wonderful opportunity to deal with um, uh, an incident because the, the, the call has come in very early. Uh, Abraham Moss Centre in the late 90s, they lost their entire uh, school, 2,000 pupils lost their school after a light fitting set on fire. Give the fire service a ring, get them down, have confidence to phone them up and, and get them down. You're not ordering the fire service like you would order a pizza, get yourself down here. What you're actually doing is throwing that call in, you're speaking to the operator. They're not as busy as the police and the ambulance control rooms. Northwest Fire Control, based in Warrington, will pick up the call, have the conversation. The fire alarm's activated. We can smell something in the air. Oh, right, okay, we'll send a truck out to that. They've got lots of sensitive equipment in the fire service. When they arrive, they're not necessarily dragging off hoses and, um, uh, you know, axes and all the rest of it. They'll take, if, if you phone them early enough, they might just get the thermal image scanner off. Find that location. Find that heat source that's causing the smell in your office it's coming from the roof structure here but you can't see it uh, they'll use the thermal image scanner to find that rogue cell in the solar panel and actually smash the problem out the water before it even becomes a problem yeah uh, we went to an incident in uh, it was the day after the christie hospital fire actually in bury and the, um, there was a, a serious fire that, was, that, that, had been, that had happened and many attempts had been made to struggle to put the fire out prior to the fire service being called. And only when they thought they couldn't manage it locally, uh, they phoned the fire service, ended up losing a building. Confidence in phoning the fire service is so, so important. So another thing that can affect that growth curve, just very quickly, we're approaching Christmas time, we're going to be at home. Uh, there's some changes that happen in our homes. You know, we get Christmas trees out, lights. Uh, people attempt to do um, fantastic cooking. Whenever change occurs in the premises, sometimes the risk can increase a little bit. And that's why we see more accidents in work environments when people lo relocate to a new place. Uh, there'll, there'll be an increase because they're getting used to the new premises. They have to have the accidents to respond to them, to find out, oh, that decking's quite wet when it gets, uh, when it rains. So the signs start to appear, we start to normalize. Anytime change occurs, then 
of course, the risk does creep up a little bit. So it's going to be colder. People are going to get the portable heaters out. It's going to be Christmas time. People might be drinking at home. Uh, we know that when people stay at home more, we get more fires. We had a threefold increase when COVID-19 first started. There was a number of factors that, that caused the fire, the, the increase in uh, fire statistics at that time. Lots of people burning waste off in the back garden because there's no recycling centres open and nowhere to take all their DIY project uh, waste produce. Uh, so, of course, uh, we ended up with quite a number of fires as a result of that. But domestic safety is such an important part uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, protecting yourselves and your family. This picture was taken inside a premises following a fire. Uh, that door there is uh, a domestic door. It's not a fire compartment door. A fire compartment door will last half an hour in a fire, and that's with direct flame impingement on the back of the door. It takes half an hour to eat through that door. So to in upset or to slow down, I suppose, that growth curve we talked about before, if you shut a door on a fire, if you decide not to put the fire out, you shut the door on a fire, you're going to, you know, you've done the initial investigation, you see what you've got, decide not to put it out, you shut the door on that fire, you get the fire service out, and then you, um, uh, and then you focus on the other evacuation strategies. But any door that you close will do a wonderful job. This is a lightweight, honeycomb centered door lightweight that you find at home it's actually done a really good job it's only when you see the kitchen on the other side that you realize how effective it's been now it's really important to think about how uh, in home environments uh, it's a blend of what we call passive and active measures the passive measures are the fabric of the building the doors how it's been built everything else the active measures are things that are powered things that come on so typically we're talking about the fire alarm system or the domestic smoke detectors so at home, we actually want the doors to perform slightly less well than the doors do at work. And when I say that, we actually want this seepage to take place. We want this little bit of smoke to get around the edge because if you had a proper fire compartment door separating your stairs from your lounge, the fire, uh, would, your fire alarm would never come on because your fire alarm system or your fire detectors are located at the bottom of the stairs, one at the top of the stairs. You could have a healthy fire in the lounge you would never find out about it. We want that little bit of seepage to get through. Smoke detector is going to come on and you're going to be able to get up, respond, come down the stairs and, um, you know, you'll have a tenable or survivable atmosphere. Open the front door and get out. That's the third element, keys available. So, smoke, so you want doors closed, smoke detectors fitted, keys available. All fire services in the UK uh, fit smoke detectors for free. Um, there's a, it's a government funded initiative. It costs something like 1.6 million pounds to investigate a fire death. Uh, if you spend that money on fire detection or uh, domestic smoke detectors, battery operated with lithium ion batteries in, which last 10 years, absolutely brilliant, uh, and get the fire crews gainfully employed fitting these detectors, you're going to save some property and you're certainly going to save some lives. Uh, so, you know, it's really important that if you do finish today uh, your work environment, or if you are working from home after this talk, do me a brilliant favor go and press that button go and give it a test make sure it comes on because it, it that is probably one of the main reasons i could probably list about 25 30 reasons why we get less fires now than we did in the terrible year of 1979 which is on record as the worst year for accidental fire deaths uh, nearly 40 years ago but one of the biggest reasons we have a reduction in fire deaths is absolutely the arrival and the uh, 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 adoption of smoke detection in domestic property. Uh, so make sure that thing's working, make sure you've got your doors closed when you go to bed and make sure you've got keys available, particularly if you've got UVP, uh, uh, UPVC doors. Okay, so one thing I would say, just as a, you know, it's a very quick talk. I've got to get through uh, some, you, you know, I've not done this talk before, so I had a, an idea how long it'd last. Um, but one thing I would say, if you are a, a business owner, if you drop me an, an email, uh, I can send through uh, one of these uh, fire alarm management cards. You can leave these in your fire alarm panel. And it's simply uh, a, a, a nice flow chart. You pick it up and you can just go through it when your fire alarm activates and, uh, and, and conclude the incident very quickly. And don't forget, we're not just talking about fires, we're talking about disruption to business. If you've got a thousand pupils in a college, and they're outside for an hour uh, because you've mismanaged the fire alarm system, uh, you know, that's a thousand hours of lost education time. So, of course, it's important we conclude these, uh, this, uh, this, this um, uh, fire alarm activation as quickly as possible. So that's quite useful. It's also got the extinguisher prompt chart 
And the message is, of course, don't fight a fire unless you've been uh, formally shown how to use a fire extinguisher. Uh, also, we do the fire warden quick guys. I can bag these up for you, stick them in an envelope. It's a, a nice, it'd be my pleasure to send that out to you. It gives you a little bit more information. And of course, I'm always available for these, uh, you know, for a, a conversation uh, around fire. Um, so what I've tried to do is it's 26 minutes past 10 now. Um, I, I'm going to uh, just have a look and see if I can access the um, messages because uh, messages well it wasn't uh, I didn't see the messages while I've been talking so <laughs> I did say I was trying to uh, incorporate them in so I'm going to try and find uh, messages on here now let me just um, start I'm going to stop the screen share uh, and then go into messages Ooh. give me a second right okay uh, right okay so that, that we've got the messages open now. Thankfully, not many people have asked the mess, uh, uh, for, for uh, uh, a, um, a message or asked for a question, which is really useful because I wasn't looking at them. <laughs> but I am available for questions now. So anything you want to ask, go ahead. I'll try my best. Steve, I have a question, if that's OK. Yes. It's, um, it's about a house, not a business, because I work for the chamber. <laughs> um, okay. But my, um, so we had the fire come out, uh, the, uh, we got leaflets and stuff about 10 years ago, actually, um, promoting the, the installation of the, um, of the detectors. And they came and installed them, and they, um, they actually recommended, we used to have um, a smoke detector at the bottom of the stairs and at the top of the stairs, but they actually recommended, because of the style of the house, to have one in the lounge as opposed to Sorry. I've just lost you there. You've just frozen. So we now don't have one at the bottom of the stairs. Do you think I need to change that? Uh, you've right. you actually broke up. You actually broke up a little bit there, Sarah. So you, you asked for an additional detector. Oh, to sorry. Be because, yes. of, because of the style. Of so basically they came, that's it. Yeah, they came and had a look around the house and they basically recommended, we don't have one at the bottom of the stairs. We have one in the lounge um, um, because it kind of fed through from the kitchen. Um, so we don't have one anymore at the mm. foot of the stairs. Do we need to add one there as well, do you think? All you're trying to do, I mean, it's not rocket science. What we're trying to do is is, um, is ensure you've got safe passage yeah. out of your home. You're protecting your escape route. So sometimes there's a balance uh, between the um, uh, problems with having, uh, you know, false alarms every time you're doing cooking, if it's too close to the, the kitchen, versus having that level of protection uh, for the that fire that may never happen. So what you want is to is to ensure it's protecting your escape route. So that, that that's what they do. They want to ensure that the atmosphere stays tenable for you to get outside the building. I mean, if you wanted to draw a quick line drawing, you can always email me across a picture, and I'll just give you a little bit more input uh, on that. But that's what they're trying to do. Okay, let's have a quick look on these these questions here. What sort of training would you yeah. recommend? Okay. You mentioned fire, yeah. are other types of fire training you'd recommend. Well. So this is uh, come from uh, Debbie. And of course, the important thing is to create audit trails. That's really, really important because audit trails, uh, you know, that uh, will protect you uh, under the Reg Reform Fire Safety Audit. It's written in there, it's called due diligence. You've got, if you end up in court because somebody's been injured in a fire, you only have to breathe smoke in to be injured. Then of course, you want to be able to demonstrate compliance. So. Every single member of staff should have been told at some point what to do in the case of fire. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they all have to have formal training, but they should at least have had an induction with a piece of paper that says you must leave by your closest safe exit. Do not tackle a fire unless you've been formally shown how to use a fire extinguisher. Um, so uh, I would normally recommend that uh, formal training would take place uh, for, you know, basic fire extinguisher training which, uh, is, is, is for about a third of the workforce as a minimum. You want, you know, it is actually under health and safety law. Uh, people have to be trained on pieces of equipment in work environments that they may have to use, that they have to use. So fire extinguishers are part of that. Uh, but um, so, and if you've got larger buildings where you need to have evacuation put in place, then some a half day fire marshal course is always useful 
the training that we provide, of course, is, is that's what we centre on the, the live fire training with the propane rigs, and also we, uh, we we talk about strategies that can work on your premises. Uh, you know, we do the bespoke training. So if you are, just so if you know, if you are, you know, that's our general fire marshal guide. But we do have bespoke ones for educational premises and for care home premises as well. So I've had another one here. Uh, really like phase. It's not just the cause of the fire; it's the problem. Do you think the same principle applies in other topics? I mean, health and safety. Oh, do you know, I love this person, uh, Catherine Dobson. What a brilliant thing, you know, and they call it system fail. And I love this because we, 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 there's, there's um, a catalyst for, uh, for, for the, the uh, outcome, uh, whatever it is. But you find that all the planets have already lined up badly. So when an event or incident occurs, Actually, there was already a catastrophic failing in many areas. The training wasn't in place, the, the, the strategy wasn't up to speed, the fire risk assessment wasn't up to speed, or the health and safety risk assessment, whatever it is. And actually, the, the planets are already lined up. And I often say the only thing missing in many buildings out there is the fire itself. And it's only the day that the fire happens you realize wow, the Bolt Motown group. Uh, so the, Mo the Motown Hotel in Bolton ended up in court. They were fined £400,000 uh, from an incident that happened in 2001, which resulted in the deaths of uh, two people. It was interesting because I went to the incident, but I also uh, was involved in the investigation side of things because uh, I was based at headquarters at that time. But what was interesting, there was, it was an arson event. Uh, a, 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 the person who set the fire ended up in prison for 15 years, but the hotel were habitually storing beds in, this is all in the public domain, habitually storing the beds in the common parts of the hotel. And they shouldn't be doing that. They need to be locked behind a, a, in a bedding store. So actually, it, when we talk about system failure, you can actually see yourself gravitating towards this, this problem. Uh, it's, it's simple things like in a school environment, we always say, you know, the, the teaching, sorry, the, the last people in, the, 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 which are often the cleaners, close all the doors down you have that rogue fire in the middle of the night that smoke and the, the biggest constituent of smoke of course is solid matter atomized droplets of carbonaceous material which will coat every surface it gets access to if you lock all your doors down you're going to have one classroom unavailable for training in or for using uh, if you have leave your doors open then you're going to write the school off um, so, so it, compartmentation is absolutely you know important for, for that element but it does uh, it is true to say that it's, uh, it's not just about cause. The cause highlights the, all the other problems that were already in place. So what we do is, is, is provide training to minimize the chance of that fire breaking out in the first place and do the hazard spotting. Um, but if anyone's got any other questions, um, uh, you know, so I, I'll, what I'll do is I've just seen one come in. I, I really like it if you just send me a quick email so I can give you a fuller, more comprehensive answer. I'm just mindful of time. Uh, and uh, obviously, Sa you know, Simon has uh, given me a brief to sort of wind it up <laughs> at a certain point. You're all um, right for a few minutes, though. If, I, and because we, we've, we've got 28 on the call, um, if, you wanna, if you've got a specific question you want to just put to Steve, I love your enthusiasm, Steve. You've got me uh, sort of hyper and excited oh, about yeah. the topic. So it's, it's, it's really, inf and I imagine on a training day, you'd be, uh, you'd, you'd be similarly engaging all day um so just unmute yourself if you want to put a question directly to steve we've got probably five minutes or so for for questions um steve you said uh, the one takeaway for for domestic is to if you do one thing go away and check your smoke alarms uh, in your house what what would your one takeaway be for for commercial you know if someone's sat in their business premises now when they finish this zoom in 10 minutes time what one thing should they do oh, you really i wish you'd said two all right, I'll give you two. Take two. <laughs> okay. Priority, okay? Have a look at that panel. Get that panel is the thing that's going to absolutely save you. So make sure you're familiar with your panel. And the other thing I would latch onto that is get your resilience in. It's great having, uh, you know, a, I don't know, a kind of warehouse environment that's 24-7, having a health and safety manager has a robust, you know, response strategy. You've got to think about the lowest resilience. What if it goes off at three o'clock in the morning? You know, who, you know, you've got to make sure you've got that resilience in place. So you, the, the panel has to be easy to understand and people need to know how to respond to that, that area and make and have confidence in phoning the fire service. 
confidence in tackling a fire if it meets the criteria which is listed in these uh, uh, in here thin size fire producing very little smoke etc uh, and you know what's on fire and if not shut the door get on the phone to the fire service you've got to think about your resilience because the during the day you might get a very different set of circumstances at three or four o'clock in the morning so for me the panel make sure you've got your zone map up or that it, you can easily understand it because that is going to give you the wind of opportunity, the gift that we never had many years ago before auto detection arrived. And then secondly, making sure the person who's looking at the panel absolutely can confidently respond to that because this is the difference between having a Notre Dame and having a business that's functioning normally tomorrow. Okay. Great. Thanks. Right, I'm looking at my uh, my gallery of people. I know someone has got a question for us. Oh, Debbie. Hi, Deb. Hi, Ab. Um, Steve, how important is it to have regular uh, updates with your training? Um, I know you talk about fire alarms lasting for like 10 years, but what about knowledge and fire safety knowledge for yeah. individuals? Yeah, I mean, uh, in, a, in a work environment, the, uh, if, you, if you say, for example, um, first aid training is, is very, uh, it's very prescriptive, you know, it will say, um, uh, you know, it's three years, it just expires. One day you could do CPR, the next day, no, you can't. It just runs out on that night. With fire training, it's a little bit more woolly. Uh, it talks about frequently. So we have a benchmark standard, which we would say, for, you know, in a, a, a low risk premises, offices, places like that, we might say every three years you would update it and then but in higher risk premises every two years uh, you know chemical factories etc uh, every couple of years and, um, and and as i say it's about creating those audit trails uh, because of course it's it, it's it's only a, a jury that would decide if what you've put in place is suitable and sufficient so that's my benchmark sort of standard for refresher training i mean that's why We've kind of, uh, we've developed a, 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 a dashboard training management system, which uh, so people ever do use or so they get, do get a, a, what, that one email in three years time just to say, you know, you do your, your refresher training, which has been quite useful. I've got a question here that talks about um, robust ro roll calls. I just want to quickly touch on roll calls because people can get involved, you know, very uh, over the top about roll call systems we do we do quite a bit on the training about um about uh, human behavior and we know this is a problem human behavior in fire uh, i went to a recent incident where i was walking up the stairs in a in a, a, a building the fire alarm had activated everyone was seemingly outside and there was an electrician working away in that building independently who didn't come out and he asked me you know oh uh, is there a fire i said well we're just checking actually uh, we don't know yet. He said, oh, well, no one's told me to leave. And I thought, and even though this per the fire alarm was ringing, this person hadn't responded. And it's a known, it's a known phenomenon, this. Uh, the um, uh, people don't tend to treat fire alarms in isolation as, uh, as something they need to respond to. They'll expect further information. Uh, you know, and in this case, this building hadn't done a sweep, but they were doing roll calls outside. Roll calls, for me, are the icing on the cake. Get the cake right first to extend the analogy. The cake is the sweep. If you sweep that premises and someone's missing outside on the roll call system, it's because they're out shopping, if the shops are open, of course, um, but uh, or not on site. You get the sweep done first. That is that is about your that that's that, that, and have it written down. Also, we, we we you've got to think carefully nowadays because uh, we, we in in 1975. When we just all worked nine till five, not me, of course, I was just busy drinking my morning milk at nursery because <laughs> I was only a kid then. But I am 15 at next week. Don't tell anyone. Um, so uh, not that it's relevant to this. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in 1975, people worked nine till five. It's really easy to put a strategy in place. Not now where we have core hours. You're working 10 till three. You can start early, finish early. Some people work flexibly. So what we do is ha we can have a system where We've got uh, a card-based system where all the marshals that are on duty at that moment can respond centrally to a location. And actually, the, that's your sweep area, that's your sweep area. And they're empowered or given that role at the moment the fire alarm activates. So the card-based system is something we, we also push uh, to, to provide that level of resilience because it, it, you, you've got to cover, you've got to think about every eventuality when you're thinking about resilience, okay? So Thanks that was a little bit on the roll call. 
Last okay. last call for questions. Hi, um, hi, uh, Steve. I've got a question for you. Uh, Phil, Phil Masters here from Orange Fire Protection. Uh, one question that I get asked quite a lot is with regards to sprinklers is how much damage does that cause? And now my answer to that is um, if it, if it um, operates, it's 65 litres a minute for normally 30 minutes. That's what it runs for. It gives you guys a chance to get there with your, with your service pump. My question is how much pressure and flow rate does one of your pumps operate at because the question what i said to people look if the fire brigade do turn up it's gonna there's gonna be a lot of damage with the hoses now if we can stop that by putting a sprinkler system in which stops the fire even starting then that's a real benefit so i was just asking kind of what flow and pressure does one of your pumps provide well i i think i think one of the important things is a bit more of a fuller response really to that the important thing is is sprinklers are absolutely fantastic they do a wonderful job and on two thirds of occasions, one sprinkler bulb will operate and will put the fire out. On 99% of occasions, two bulbs will control and extinguish that fire. So that's, that's the starting point. Sprinklers do a wonderful job. And if we think about a laid approach to risk, the ignition happens, we have a, a, the a intervention by a staff member. Uh, typically a sprinkler bulb will trip for the red bulbs it's 68 degrees at ceiling height and it'll pop and then you'll get the water that comes out the problem with that is is it's not it, it, that you have to have a significant temperature you have to have a margin of safety and so you have to have a fairly developed fire that's probably quite smoky there will be a bit of damage but your building is not going to burn down the sprinkler bulb will pop and do its job so when we talk about you know flow rates you know uh, the, the, the important thing to recognize the fire service they're not uh, like sprinklers, which are um, uh, which just uh, binary in operation. They just come on. The uh, the um, uh, the fire service obviously have a duty of care under the regulatory for uh, under the Fire and Rescue Services Act 2004 to minimise the damage caused in the firefighting operation. So they're not just going to go around and wash it down the river. They're going to use as li little water as possible. But my my strong uh, opinion is actually there's already been failings if you get to that point where they're going in with big hoses because you've got a well-developed fire. And that can all be managed proactively by having really good risk assessments, really good training. And the sprinkler is the stop, is, is the thing that's just, that's normally the thing that will put a stop on it. We had a terrible fire uh, and tr sprinklers also come with training. Some people think, you know, because they're open-ended, they just keep running. In Ocado, in Hampshire, uh, they actually, um, a terrible fire uh, at Takado, uh, destroyed their entire uh, automated warehouse down there, cost £100 million to the organisation. The staff actually turned the sprinkler systems off. For me, if any dabble in regards to fire, if your sprinkler valve operates and it's doing its job, you get the fire service out as well because they carry the can then. If they choose to turn the sprinkler valve off, that's fine if it, if it, it, it you know, because... They, they've risk assessed it and they, they put hoses down to, uh, you know, clear, leave them closed, switch the sprinkler valve off, and then they can just put out pockets of fire with a little, with, with a, you know, controlled by, uh, by a firefighter who, who's got that tra level of training. But sprinklers are, you know, if you've got a sprinkler building, you know, it's, it's, it's firefighter safety, absolutely. Uh, it, it, you know, and also business continuity safety. Normally, it's only one bulb that ever operates. So I think the, the answer to the question is, yeah, flow rates, you know, 160, 260 litres a minute, no problem, uh, you, you know, at the, at, ho at the end of a, a hose on, on a branch, but it's it's controlled by a firefighter so with, with, a, with an on-off valve. So they're not, they're not, they shouldn't be washing it down the river. They should be minimising the damage caused in the event of, attempting to fight, fight fire but that sprinkler is is the is the, the another layer which stops getting to this end game of total building loss uh, it's hard to, in this sort of uh, environment it's a, it's a more of a fuller conversation to happen but very pro very pro sprinklers they do a brilliant job uh if you're in the building but there's also don't just think because you've got sprinkler bulbs that you don't need fire extinguishers because fire extinguishers will put a fire out. I've actually got a video of a, of a fire in a premises that lasted 12 and a half minutes before the sprinkler bulb came on. And that was wholly manageable. It just took time to get to that stage. Uh, that, that fire that we saw in the back garden, of course, it was in a back garden during those slides. That would have, um, uh, you know, that wouldn't have tri tripped a sprinkler bulb for an hour and 10 minutes, really. But it was only when it started to really start to pump out that thermal energy with the bulb pop. 
So you've still got that, that extra layer in between, which is your local application using the fire extinguisher. Thanks, Steve. Okay. We've got one last question, which I'm going to try and sneak in from, from Chris. Go on, Chris. Thanks, Simon. Hi, Steve. As always, an enthusiastic presentation. Always uh, all inspiring and very inspiring. Um, just to change the subject a little bit from buildings, with the, the increase in popularity in electric vehicles, um, and, and given the, the ferocity of that little battery fire that you showed in that video, uh, are there any words of wisdom or things that we should be starting to think about as uh, fire safety professionals and safety professionals in terms of the electric fleet? You know, it's a, it's a brilliant question. And the, I, I would always answer these questions with, with uh, the starting point for everything is the fire risk assessment. The fire risk assessment drives everything because you get a competent person in and part of that risk assessment process to ascertain what is the appropriate extinguishing media and response and strategy that would would allow you to to manage that but it's as you're quite right chris it's an evolving um uh, uh, industry uh, you've seen companies like uh, neo uh, shares in uh, in, in uh, over in the far east go from two pound fifty up to fifty eight quid so clearly it's a massively growing industry tesla i think is the second biggest um, uh, company on the planet now. Uh, I know we've had a lot of input uh, in uh, at working in terms of dealing with electric vehicle fires, and they, they can be problematic because of the the way they invert, and you can get a serious belt uh, off uh, off um, something that's uh, powered by a lithium ion battery uh, if it's if it's if the if the current and voltage has been uh, tampered with to the extent it's producing a lot of uh, electrical energy. Um, so. For me, it, 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 you know, in 2012, we talked about getting dry powders out of buildings because they were so um, uh, invasive up your nose. To, you know, you can't uh, find your way around. They, they disorientate you. They create an unbelievable mess. But it's a dry agent and it works brilliantly on anything electrical. I think uh, you will see a lot more dry powder, uh, dry powder extinguishers being installed externally and that's actually where you want them outside at charging points for electrical electrical vehicles in the future but i think i think the fire industry as a whole will respond as the as as the threat increase not as a threat but as the industry develops and becomes more wide and more uh, and more um sort of established in the country it's very early days it's massively evolving and we'll, we'll sort of take our lead off the uh, the, the the powers that be uh, that uh, the institutes out there BAFE and etc. But uh, you know society changes all the time, doesn't it? Okay, great question, Chris from Debbie. There you go. She's a big fan of yours. I know that because we chatted to her on the phone. <laughs> right. Thank you, right, Steve. Then. Thank you very much indeed. Um, love your enthusiasm. Clearly, you've got oodles of knowledge, and uh, and we will include your contact details um, in the post event email so that people can contact you directly uh, no thank, problem thank you for taking us through that this morning um a very informative end to um our what's well, been a packed year of webinars actually from from east lanks chamber so uh, thank you steve uh, thank you also to to tim and into solia for sponsoring the health and safety forum thank you to all our audience as well for supporting us not only on today's event but but through what's been a topsy-turvy year of uh, of 2020 uh, just a couple of reminders, uh, chamberlive.co.uk for our 2021 events programme, not too early to, to spot ones that are of interest to you and, um, and register for them, get them in your diary. Uh, we do have sponsorship opportunities available for future Chamber Live webinars and our physical events programme, which will be kick-starting uh, hopefully as soon as we're allowed to, depending what tier we end up in. Uh, again, all those details available from myself, from Sarah or from Debbie. And uh, as soon as the webinar is concluded, um, go and check your smoke alarms, go and check your fire alarm panel and check your resilience and make sure everyone knows how to respond to it. Uh, have yourself a very safe, uh, enjoyable, relaxing Christmas and New Year and we'll see you all online and hopefully in person in 2021. Take care, everybody. Thanks for watching this Chamber Live video from the East Lancashire Chamber of Commerce. If you've enjoyed this content, then you might enjoy some of the other content that's on the screen now. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel.